Good morning, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Tactics for Sedge and Kalinga Control, presented by PBI Gordon and taught by Aaron Patton, Ph.D. My name is Lisa Wick. I'm the Senior Manager of eLearning Programs and will be today's moderator. We are recording today's event, and access to that recording will be sent as part of your follow-up email. Your audio is muted in this system, but we encourage you to ask questions as we go along. You can use the raise hand button to let us know you want to be unmuted, or you can type into the question answer box and send your questions that way. If your control panel has minimized, you'll see a narrow strip with an orange ring tickle at the top. If you click on that, the panel will expand. Then you'll be able to access that question answer box as well as today's handout. This session is eligible for 0.1 GCSA education points at the end of the program. We'll give you the code to use on the association's website. We hope you'll find today's webinar valuable. It is brought to us in partnership with PBI Gordon with a full line of herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, growth regulators, and other products. PBI Gordon Corporation is a national leader in the professional turf and ornamental management industry. Aaron J. Patton, Ph.D., is a professor in the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture at Purdue University, where he serves as turfgrass extension specialist. He earned his bachelor's from Iowa State University and his master's and Ph.D. from Purdue University. His appointment provides him the opportunity to be involved with extension, teaching, and research. Patton's research interests focus on weed biology and control warm season grasses, and agronomic practices in turf grass systems. He's been a GCSA faculty member since 2008, teaching both webinars and seminars. Please join me in welcoming today's presenter, Aaron Patton, PhD. Aaron? Okay, great. Thanks, Lisa. You're welcome. All right, so um, I'm looking forward to our discussion about sedges uh, today. And we're actually going to try to tackle about six different um, sed species. Uh, they're going to be listed here uh, on the screen. And one thing I'll just kind of say up front is, and I'll spend a lot of time talking about herbicides today, because one thing about these sedges may be a little bit different than some of the other weeds that we do research on is we don't know as much about cultural controls for managing some of these sedges. Um, you know, yellow nut sedge, we, we know a little bit more about that one because that's really problematic, but some of these other sedge species are just either harder to work with or they're, they're just not as well studied or they're new, newer problems. And so uh, I'll kind of share what we know about them, but, uh, but for some of these species, we're kind of almost just now launching, uh, you know, uh, a series of experiments to learn more about, uh, more about these sedges. So, on the screen here, you'll see the geography of where these sedge species are, are located. We're going to revisit each one of those as we go through the presentation, but just kind of pick where you are in the country and, uh, and uh, see where these sedge species are. Now, these are maps that I've created about uh, regarding the distribution of these species. And so if you're somewhere close to the transition line of any of these spe uh, species, then it's, it's very likely that you probably have these because uh, many of these sedge species are still kind of moving and expanding uh, in their in their geography. Now, just quickly, a little bit about sedges, uh, just so we're on the same pages. Is uh, there's actually many sedges out there, uh, over 100 uh, genera. So that's to think of that genus name. And but there's over 5,000 species uh, worldwide. And we normally think about sedges growing in wet areas, and so certainly there's sedges that. You know, we're not going to talk about today with it. If you were wanting, you know, some, some plants for wetlands and, and uh, you know, those kind of areas on your golf course, we'd have all kinds of other species that we could talk about. But we're going to focus just obviously on the sedge species that most typically grow in turf. And even that, we're only going to hit, uh, you know, six of these. There's more than six species of sedges, certainly, that grow in turf. Now, we all kind of know that sedges... Uh, uh, the old saying is sedges have edges, uh, and that sedges have this triangular uh, stem that you can see here in the picture. And we're going to look at some pictures of that. And that's one way we can differentiate a sedge from a grass. And if you've been in this industry for a while, you might say, well, of course I know how to 
identify a sedge from a grass, but I was caught off guard uh, a few years back when uh, I had to um, identify a species called wood rush, which even though it's called a rush, which we see on the left there, it's actually a sedge. And I just kept trying to figure out what grass is that. When I finally, you know, backed up, and uh, I noticed, hey, no, this isn't a grass at all. This is a sedge. So it's important to remember that, uh, you know, sedges have these triangular uh, stems and they're distinct uh, from the grasses, which have either a round or a flattened stem. And also remembering that grasses, sedges are three ranked, meaning they have leaves arranged 120 degrees from one another, where grasses are two ranked and they have leaves arranged 180 degrees from one another. So I say that it's the stuff we've all learned before, but let's not get fooled occasionally when we go to identify a plant by jumping to a conclusion too quickly before we look at all the different plant parts. Now, when we talk about sedges too, we have to remember there's both annual and perennial sedge species. So um, the annual species obviously are going to distribute mostly by seed, whereas most of the perennial sedges will um, will spread via rhizomes and some of them have tubers, some of them don't. So we'll talk about that today. Um, some uh, of these perennial sedges can also establish by seed, such as false green Kalinga. So we'll mention that one today. But other sedge species like yellow nut sedge, it rarely establishes by seed. It's almost exclusively by the spreading of, of the rhizomes and the propagation of tubers underground. So we're going to kind of talk about all these sedge species today. Now, some of the data that I'll be sharing uh, with you today on uh, how to control these sedge species is in a publication that I and uh, 15 other states collaborate on every year. It's called Turfgrass Weed Control for Professionals. Uh, and you can order a copy online uh, from Purdue's education store. So you can just kind of search the title of that in Purdue and should be able to find it. And if not, you can just send me an email. My contact information will be at the end here today. And um, so I'm going to share all the control recommendations regarding sedges. So you don't necessarily need to get this publication uh, to find that because I'll share it with you today. But if you need a, a good resource for weed control information, then, then this publication should cover all your common weed control questions. Now, some of this information we've also distilled for homeowners uh, in these publications. So we have one called Sedge Control for Professionals on the left that kind of distills sedge specific info out of that larger publication and that's free and you can find that online. And there's one on the right called Yellow Nut Sedge Control. So if you have homeowners, you know, at your golf course or whatever, that are asking you about how to control nut sedges, uh, then you can, you can certainly uh, point them towards that publication. Another thing that I found is that, uh, particularly in the lawn care industry, sometimes they, they don't know their weed identification as well as they should. Uh, we know you as a superintendent probably know your weed identification really well, but maybe not all your employees do. So we developed a poster uh, just this last year uh, to help people identify the most common uh, grass or grass-like weeds there shown on the left and the most common broadleaf weeds on the right. And uh, so this covers pretty much any weeds you would find kind of in the transition zone and north. And um, so that might be a resource uh, that you might want to use on a golf course. We've got the folks, you know, here in Indiana, they put them in their, their trailers, you know, for the lawn care industry, but you could put it in your shop. Uh, in your break room, in your chemical mixing room, something like that, just to help your employees passively learn a little bit about weed control identification uh, on the job. We also have an app that's really geared more towards kind of homeowners and starting uh, lawn care companies right now, um, but it covers weed identification, insect disease identification, as well as other uh, abiotic stresses, and uh, it's just $1.99, so we, we encourage kind of beginners to turf to, uh, to get that and, and uh, learn, learn from that. So, all right, that's my sales pitch. And uh, now I'll tell you about some, some of these nut sedge or some of these sedges. So the first one we're gonna talk about is probably the most common. It is the most common and it's one we'll spend the most time on. And then we'll, we'll distill into these other species. So yellow nut sedge, sometimes called nut grass, and actually, even by weed scientists until about the 1950s, it was called nut grass, even though it obviously is not a grass, it's a sedge. And it gets its name yellow nut sedge, as you can tell from the uh, kind of yellow or golden color of its seed head. 
But remember, those seeds are not very viable, only about 2% viable. So it's not the seed that's spreading the weed, but the underground parts we'll take a look at in just a minute. Now, you may have also heard, uh, if you look down there at the bottom, the name chufa or tiger nuts. These are, um, it's a particular variety of yellow nut sedge that produces a larger tuber. And these tubers are sweet tasting and wildlife, particularly turkeys, feed on them. So you can actually go online and buy a 50 pound bag of yellow nut sedge nutlets. And it's this specific variety chufa here. Um, but this variety will not overwinter in areas farther north. It doesn't have cold, cold hardiness like our native yellow nut sedge populations do, but it is something that if you're a hunter and you want some uh, you want some bait for your turkeys, you could go and buy some chufa and plant out uh, in your in your favorite uh, hunting spot. If that's legal in your state, I'm not sure about that. So I'm not sure if that counts as baiting the animals or not. All right. Uh, again, here's the, just some pictures based on those drawings we looked at earlier. Remembering that yellow knot sedge has that triangular state uh, shaped stem, whereas our grasses are going to have round or flattened stems. Uh, remembering also that the sedges are three ranked. So whether we're looking at yellow nut sedge in the top left corner or a Kalinga, it looks like a false green Kalinga in the bottom left corner, we see that there are those three uh, leaves there separated 120 degrees from one another. And that tells us that it is in fact a, uh, a sedge. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, not the best picture, but we see one leaf coming off one side of the stem and then 180 degrees and up the stem we see another leaf coming off the plant and that's uh well the two ranked uh, pattern that we see in grasses now uh, another thing besides the triangular stem and yellow nut sedge which you see here on the left we also note that yellow nut sedge has this uh, really deep midrib. So if you take a leaf off, you'll notice a really deep uh, midrib. And so certainly grasses don't typically have that deep of a midrib. Maybe some of our ornamental grasses do, but on our turf grasses, that's another way you can distinguish yellow nut sedge from other plants. And then like I mentioned earlier, the, the golden or kind of yellow brown uh, seed head color is where this one gets its name. And it's distributed essentially across the whole U.S. So if you really hate this weed, you know, you can move to northern Montana to try to get away from it or maybe parts of Canada, but uh, pretty much everywhere in the U.S. we're going to have uh, yellow nut sedge. All right, now we know that generally sedges grow in moist habitats. So this could be areas that are poorly drained, it could be areas that are just uh, irrigated, right? It doesn't mean they're over irrigated, just irrigated, and that creates a great habitat for uh, yellow nut sedge. Um, there are different varieties of yellow nut sedge. I mentioned that earlier when I talked about chufa. We don't really understand that real well, but we do know that uh, maybe the variety of yellow nut sedge you have on your golf course is probably different than the one that's uh, you know 10 or 15 miles down the road. But we know that generally within, we could say within a crop field or probably within a golf course, most of the yellow nut sedge on that golf course is probably a clonal copy of one another, meaning it's it's basically uh, the same, exactly the same um, because it's spread vegetatively. And so what that means for you is that, uh, you know, if you, sh you can control your yellow nut sedge on one side of the golf course with a herbicide, you should be able to control it exactly the same on the other side of the golf course. So um, there shouldn't be anything there with varieties, you know, causing you problems with controlling across the golf course. It is a, uh, a perennial. It perenniates by surviving in these tubers that are in the soil, much like a, uh, you know, a, a bulb would like on a, on a daffodil or a tulip or something like that. But the way it spreads is through these rhizomes. You can see on the bottom left picture. And when these rhizomes get long enough and the day length gets just right, the, the end of these rhizomes will swell up. And that's where this tuber is being formed. So when you look at the right and you see those tubers, they're attached on the end of that uh, rhizome. So it's a pretty interesting plant that it spreads out sideways with these rhizomes and then at the tip of the rhizome uh, forms these uh, tubers. And then, 
you know, those tubers germinate in the springtime and out pops the uh, yellow nut sedge plants. Now, generally, you'll see yellow nut sedge emerging from the soil sometime just right after crabgrass does. So it's usually a week or two after crabgrass will start to germinate. That's actually when you see yellow nut sedge uh, germinating and popping out of the soil, but we don't normally notice it then. It's not until uh, kind of summertime when the yellow nut sedge is growing way faster than our grasses that we often notice the yellow nut sedge, but it's emerging much earlier than the year than, than we generally see. Again, as these plants grow, they spread out via these rhizomes. So we're looking at rhizomes, mainly not roots there. And again, at the end of those uh, rhizomes, that tuber will form. And you'll see here that that tuber just starts off small. It's white colored. And then as it matures, it obviously enlarges, but then it will start to change into kind of a golden brown color before it then matures into a, a very dark colored uh, tuber. So just kind of recap what we just talked about. Here's the general life cycle of the yellow nut sedge. So it's gonna emerge in May, uh, kind of late April, May, or right after crabgrass. It's gonna grow in the summertime and you won't really notice it till towards the, the second half of the summer. But then about July, the plant's mature enough and the day length is just right that that kind of signals to the plant it needs to start reproducing and so it starts to make these tubers. And so the key to getting good long-term control of yellow nut sedge is to try to try to hit it uh, early in the summer before it starts making tubers. Because as we're about ready to discuss, these tubers can last in the soil for multiple years. So if you wait until, let's say, September to go out and spray your yellow nut sedge, it's already made tubers at that point. And so you've basically added a year to your battle in controlling this uh, this particular weed. So, but if you can catch it early in the summer, then you can catch it before it starts to make more tubers. Once we get a frost, the uh, frost will kill the top growth, but it does not kill the tubers in the soil. The tubers overwinter, and then the following spring, this cycle repeats itself. Uh, now we mentioned these tubers form at the ends of uh, rhizomes, and, and this kind of happens, uh, you know, in the, in the second half of the summer. And most of the tubers are going to be located in the top six inches of soil. But these tubers can be produced, you know, up to uh, 12 inches or so deep. So they're actually growing pretty deep in the soil. So unlike weed seed, where the weed, like I say, a crabgrass plant makes its seed and the seed just falls right to the surface of the soil. And so that's where most of our weed seed is, is right at the surface. In the case of tubers, they are incorporated in the top 12 inches of soil. And so we can't, uh, couldn't use phrase mowing or technology like that to battle yellow nut sedge um, because it wouldn't really get at removing uh, the source of the weed, which is the tubers. And we have lots of these tubers in the soil that can be anywhere from four to 12 million tubers in an acre. Uh, so that's, that's uh, obviously a lot. I took a shovel full of uh, soil a few years back and just you know, kind of hit it with a hose to watch, uh, wash off uh, some of the soil. And you can see all the tubers there. So look around for this picture. You notice some white ones. Those are the ones that are still forming, newly formed, some that are small, some that are larger. You notice kind of some tan colored ones. And then you might notice some real dark ones that you're not sure if that's a tuber or if that's just part of the soil. But uh, just in this picture, there's 17 tubers that we can easily see and find and probably some more hidden in there. Uh, that are there. So there's certainly lots of tubers in the soil. So that's 17 nut sedge plants ready to grow all from just this one side of a scoop of uh, soil that I, I dug out. So there's certainly a lot more tubers in the soil than we we recognize in these areas. And so you can, you know, uh, take a single plant, the yellow nut sedge, and plant it, you know, and then dig it up at the end of the year and figure out how many tubers they make. And it's a lot. I, and uh, this there's a photo of a grad student, you know, who had a uh, undesirable project of counting tubers. And so he's washing those off to figure out how many tubers were produced by these plants. But certainly the, the point I'm trying to get across is they make a lot of them and a lot more than what we 
we tend to think that they're making. Hey, Erin, there's a question here that kind of relates to this because um, on the life cycle, what happens in a place where there might not be frost in southern Florida, for example? How is that life cycle affected with this number of tubers? You know, that's a great question. Um, if anything, it's, it's, it's going to, um, you know, it's not, you know, basically you can just remove that kind of one step from that, from that equation. And I think the cool nights, um, you know, unless you're in South Florida, I think the cool nights are still enough that you probably trigger some dormancy on this yellow nut sedge and, and some reinitiation and a regermination of some of those tubers when temperatures warm. But basically, you just have a longer growing season. So you have you have a plant that uh, may behave more like uh, well, I mean, it is a perennial, but it may behave just just uh, you know like grow, like it grows all year long. Just like uh, you know, in the north, we have uh, you know annual flowers that we plant you know in front of our house, so they look pretty. But if you take those same flowers and plant them in Florida, then they they live all year long. And so so I imagine. These plants would just year, live all year long and be able to produce tubers for a much longer period of time. So it really makes it more problematic in those areas. And that makes sense, right? When we go to Florida, when we see those turf areas, we see that sedges are, uh, you know, a more common problem down there. The good news is if you live in the south, you have, you have more herbicide options to use and some very good ones to use. Uh, to battle some of these sedge problems in warm season grasses that we don't necessarily have all those options in cool season grasses. Thank you. All right, now if you take these tubers and you wash them and you look at them real close, they look kind of ugly looking. Looks like almost like bugs or something here when we're, we're zoomed in. So you can see here, this is the uh, remnant of the rhizome that this tuber was attached to and we kind of see these scales on the tubers and maybe little little tiny roots uh, um, coming out of those tubers so this is what a mature uh, tuber in the soil might look like and again when the conditions are right then that tuber can then germinate much like a seed does and and make uh, new plants for us to deal with now, mainly just because I was curious and I like to learn things, I dug some tubers up a couple years ago and I washed them off and and I noticed, you know, some that were white and brand new, right? You can still see them attached to the rhizomes and I noticed some were kind of a an intermediate kind of tan color. You could tell they were maturing and then others were this, you know, real dark uh, brown color. And so I thought, I wonder, I wonder if those are any different as far as if I went to plant them you know, if they would grow any differently? And the answer is they absolutely do. So here I made this, uh, I planted them in the greenhouse. And so on the left there, you can even see my tags there are the W ones, are the ones that had a white color. And then in uh, the middle there, I planted all the tan colored ones. And then on the far right there, I planted uh, the ones that were kind of that, uh, you know, brown, dark color. And guess what? The ones that were dark brown, they all almost all germinated and made new yellow nut sedge plants. On the tan ones, we only had uh, one in the bottom uh, right there that germinated. And uh, on the white ones, none of them germinated. So what that tells us is these plants make these tubers, but they, after they're made, they need to basically sit in the soil and mature a little bit. And, you know, I didn't follow these across time here, but my guess is that some of them maybe need to have a, um, some, some type of a, um, um, I'll think of the word here. It's on the tip of my tongue here. It's a, it's a cold treatment, and we have a special scientific word we use for it. I can't think of it right now. And so they need some kind of a, probably a cold treatment. Now, that cold treatment doesn't have to be freezing or really cold. This could be a cooling off period to help them uh, finish their uh, vernalization, that was the word I was looking for, to be vernalized so that then they can uh, mature and then germinate uh, later on. Now, if you were in an area like South Florida that never had those cold treatments, then these plants, you know, they could just continue to uh, uh, spread via the rhizomes and maybe in those areas the tuber development is not as important. So again, some of these things are not really that well studied 
and so I'm just kind of sharing with you what I what I know. Um, but but I thought that was kind of an interesting thing to uh, to see that that just because there's lots of tubers in the soil doesn't mean that all of them are quite ready to germinate and become problems. But it does tell us the number that are in there and that uh, there's some in there that certainly are still maturing, ready to cause us a problem in the future. Uh, and again, here's just after we get that frost to complete the life cycle, you'll see that the, those uh, plants will um, top growth. The leaves will be killed by the frost, but again, not the uh, not the tubers. And so next year, when we see new plants coming up, it's a different plant from a from a tuber that's that's germinating. And even though it's a different plant, we still classify this as a perennial, which to me is actually somewhat confusing, but it is classified as perennial. Now, these tubers live in the soil for, uh, for quite a while, years, okay? And so the ones closest to the surface are the ones that, li that live the shortest amount of time. So the ones that are only about four inches deep, they only live about four months. That's their half-life at least. The ones that are eight inches deep live about six months. But what we know is that if you have an area that's infested with yellow nut sedge and you get on a herbicide program for three consecutive years on a row, so three consecutive years you spray the yellow nut sedge, what we know is that you'll deplete the number of tubers in a soil by 85%. So that's good and bad, right? It means that you had to work hard at battling this weed for three years and 15% of it is still left there in the soil. But it does educate us that when we develop a sedge control program for yellow nut sedge, at least, it needs to be a multi-year program because we can't just get rid of all these uh, tubers in the soil in one year. Now, uh, again, uh, yellow nut sedge it likes moist areas, so you know if we find that we have a problem with yellow nut sedge, maybe there's opportunities for us to improve our drainage maybe we can look critically at our irrigation program and decide we could probably back off of it a little bit. Uh, maybe we just have some, some grasses growing in that particular area that aren't very, uh, have very good heat tolerance. And so they kind of thin back, like maybe a perennial ryegrass might in the summertime and allow an opportunity for yellow nut sedge to come in. So we can do some cultural control and that we can make it a poorer environment for the yellow nut sedge to live in. But normally we're going to have to get in there with a herbicide if we want to get good control. And I recommend two applications a year, one at the start of the summer and then a follow-up application about six weeks later um, after we get some regrowth or some germination of some new tubers we can get in there and make an application. Now there's lots of herbicides on the market. I'll show you a full list in just a second, but generally I like to think about them because of where I live in the kind of two groups. And the top group will be ones that I could use on a cool season turf and then the bottom group will be ones that I really I'm pretty limited to using them to warm season grasses only. Uh, and so uh, with there's some minor exceptions down there, but that's kind of how these uh, group out. That's usually how I think about them, how I think about advising, you know, which ones should you use? It really depends on what your turf safety is. Now on this slide here, uh, um, and uh, you know, you'll have a copy of this PDF and this comes straight from my herbicide guide. You'll see that I have for all the sedge control herbicides and all the major sedge problem or sedge species we battle, I have some ratings for you. And we'll go through these ratings in more detail in just a bit. So you know how good these herbicides work, either poor, fair, good, or excellent on these different weeds. But also in this chart, what's really important to note is what's the safety like on the different species that I might have. And you notice I don't have seashore pass palum or St. Augustine grass or uh, centipede grass or maybe other grasses you might find in the deep south. I do have the majority of the grasses that uh, we, we face here in the turf industry uh, or they grow here in the turf industry and the safety of these herbicides uh, listed out in this chart. So you could use this chart to figure out what my sedge problem is, what grasses I have to try to find some products that you think would provide a good solution for you. Okay, so Lisa's got a, we got a poll here. We wanna poll you. And so Lisa's gonna help me run this poll. So I'm just curious before we, <clears throat> before we start to discuss maybe some of these herbicides specifically, which herbicides you might primarily used for yellow nut sedge control. 
And so I've kind of listed out some, not all, you know, there's a lot of them we can check here. And so if um, there's a Q&A box that you can type in uh, what other product that you're using. And Lisa, can you tell them how to find that Q&A box if they want to type in something else? Absolutely. It's in the control panel. So if your panel is minimized, you'll see just that narrow strip with the orange rectangle at the top. But in the section, you'll see it says question answer. And you can just type in there. And somebody has put Katana already in there. Okay, great. Well, um, while they're continuing to vote here because the votes are still coming in, I have a quick question for you. Um, if you're trying to dig up yellow nut sedge in your backyard in this one area where it's low and growing in, um, you'd need, because apparently I can't just pull it because those tubers are in there. So I would need to like dig under there to get those tubers all out, right? Correct. So, so pulling it is, as some people say, well, that's not helpful at all. Well, it is helpful because you're pulling that plant so that, it can't grow any longer and so it no longer can produce new tubers so you are helping um reduce the problem in the future somewhat yeah somewhat but you're correct that you're not removing any of those tubers in the, in the soil and so yeah you didn't actually need to dig it out almost uh almost a foot deep in order to remove all those tubers and so that's pretty impractical in most cases all right okay guys. in addition to what you're seeing here as your uh choices on your other we have the cantana monument for warm season grass uh mm -hmm. bassagran or pro sedge also q4 okay. some or certainty okay so those are your okay, other yeah. products. The pro sedge is going to be the same ingredient as the sedge hammer up there on the screen. So, but that's that's what uh, you you answered what I expected. You know, the the most common products are going to be sedge hammer, which is how software on used to be sold as manage way back in the day, and now it's available as generic, and uh, and dismiss. Those are two of uh, the um, really the two most common products on the sedge market. But as others have noted, there's products like Certainty and Monument and Katana that are also on um, good options. Okay, so let's walk through um, some of these uh, sedge control options. Again, my recommendation is to get, click back on the screen here, uh, is to make your first application. I have early June here. That obviously is for my area. Basically, the idea is that Probably make your application earlier than you think you need to. Obviously, you need to see the sedges visually, but don't wait for them to get big and robust. Make the application early in the year, early in the summer, uh, and um, and that will be helpful towards keeping this from uh, being able to produce any more nutlets. Now, most of these labels will recommend not mowing before and after an application to increase the leaf surface area. I've studied this with other weed species, and it's not as important as the label makes it out to be, but it's still, it's a, it's a good practice to employ if you can. So maybe uh, maybe if you mow on, uh, you know, Monday and Wednesdays, you could take that area and spray it on Tuesday, and then maybe wait till Thursday to mow it. Or if you have to mow it on Wednesday, that's fine. At least you know you've sprayed it and given it a good 24 hours to move in the plant before you come and, and mow that off. But the idea is just to give the herbicide more time to translocate. And again, I recommend coming back here for four to eight weeks after the application, rescouting those areas and determining if you need to make a follow-up application. And in many cases, you'll likely I'll have to do so. Now let's walk through these quickly. You're familiar with these products, so I'm going to kind of walk through these quickly. Uh, Dismiss, that's sulfventrazone, and now it's uh, available on a few generic products on the market. This gives us the fastest control of sedges of all the products on the market. It's just because this is a PPO inhibitor, and just they work quick, where a lot of the other herbicides on the market we use for sedges are, are slower acting products. So like if you're like the lawn care industry and you need something to die fast, then they like this product a lot. Or if your general manager points out that nut sedge and, and you want to make sure to solve that problem quickly so they see that you're on top of it, then, you know, this would be a good product uh, to choose. Now, we recommend, just like the label does, not to add a surfactant when you're using this product because it could increase the chance that you might get a little turf injury. 
And note that the rate on this product varies considerably by species. So whereas our cool season grasses up here on the top, we have to use the uh, lower rates. You know, on warm season grasses, you can use higher rates. Uh, and those higher rates, obviously, are going to give you better control of the sedges. So what we find is with this mist that in the north, some of our sedge species like the Kalingas, uh, it's not quite as good at, as it is in the south simply because you can use, in some cases, uh, you know, three times the rate and on the southern grasses so you get better, uh, better control. Now, FMC launched a new formulation called Dismiss NXT uh, that also contains Carpentrazone this last year. And so that's an option for you if you have some grasses and maybe some broadleaf weeds in an area, you can, you can use that product. And then the rates uh, are basically comparable to what they are on the, on the Dismiss um, product. Um, but the, the ounce is a little bit different. So what would be four ounces with Dismiss is 5.1 ounces with uh, the Dismiss NXT because it has that extra carpenter zone in the formulation. Now we did some uh, research with these uh, products uh, a couple years ago now, and I just want to show this to you. Um, so first I want you to focus on the green bars here, and we see the green bars are the, the data we got seven days after an application, and we see, you know, 80 to 90 percent control with Dismiss and Dismiss NXT, so they're at the bottom there, and you can see the rates. And so the higher the rate win, we got a little bit higher uh, control seven days after application. Then we see other products like uh, the Sedge Hammer and Solero, Bassagran, Tenacity. We don't see nearly as much injury from them. And so that's just because they're slower acting, they work slower. If we come back and we look at this same uh, study now, 35 days after the application, we see 95% control from our dismiss, 90% Sedgehammer, 100% Solero, uh, almost 90% from Tenacity. The Bassigran in this particular study, for whatever reason, did not do very well long term. But we see basically, uh, statistically, the same level of control out of almost all these products five weeks after the application. Even though they look different initially, we see that all of them are really providing uh, good control for us uh, when we look long term at, at our control. So remember that when we're using some of these sulfonylurea herbicides like the sedge hammer and the Solero, they're just uh, slower to work. Now, we see those previous slides that dismiss um, and dismiss NXT. So those are circled here. Those are products that basically have, um, they have sulfentrazone in them. And let me change my color here so you can see that either. They have sulfentrazone in them and they have a high rate of sulfentrazone in them and that's why they give, give us good sedge control. And the rate that we need in order to get really good sedge control, I'm gonna write that on the screen here, I should have typed that in. It's gonna be about 0.185 pounds of active ingredient. That's what we find as researchers that good, good yellow nut sedge control, I need about that much. And if you look at this column uh, right here, you'll see what I have highlighted for you now is all the products that provide at least that amount of rate. So you see products like Blindside, Dismiss, Dismiss NXT, Dismiss South, Echelon, Solitaire, um, and uh, Spartan Charge which is the same as, um, as the Dismiss NXT. I just don't have it highlighted correctly there. I'm just noticing on my chart there. It should be highlighted right there, okay? So what we see is um, some products have a high enough rate of sulfentrazone in them that they give us good sedge control. But not all products that have mm. sulfentrazone in them will give us that same level of control. So if we take a look now at this slide, but now I've highlighted the ones that have a lower rate of sulfentrazone in them, like Avenue South, Foundation, Q4 Plus, uh, Surge, T-Zone, those types of products. The sulfentrazone in those formulations is in there to help speed up the activity typically of a broadleaf herbicide. So those products are primarily broadleaf herbicides that provide suppression of yellow nut sedge. 
So those are products that if you had a broadleaf weed problem and you have a few sedges growing in them, those are products you'd want to use in those cases, but not the products you'd want to pick if your main target was yellow nut sedge. You want to pick a product that's got more of that active ingredient in it. And Aaron, this is the point where I say sometimes researchers use rates that are different than what practitioners can because the label is the law. And so practitioners need to know what the label is, what the product is registered for in their area. But in this case, these are all rates that are on the label, correct? That is correct. You have all these, so that column is based on the label rate. Now, it's the label rate across all the species. So on your, if you have a cool season grass, it may be beyond the rate for your cool season grass species, but I'm just across all the rates on the, on the label, okay? And if you had a question on that, if you were using a particular product at a particular rate and you wanted you know, to know if, uh, how much that's delivering, then I'd be happy to, to help you out by email on that. All right, now uh, let's go through a few of these other products. So here's Sedge Hammer. So that's the Howl Soft You're On. And again, products like uh, Howl Soft You're On Pro uh, are on the market, Sandia. There's other generic uh, Howl Soft You're On products. And again, this was the product sold as Manage um, by Monsanto for a number of years before it got moved over to Gallon. And this one is goes out at a low application rate. And on this one, we certainly do want to add the non-ionic surfactant because we'll just get really poor control if we don't. Uh, and again, here's uh, oh, um, another formulation that you may not know about. This one is uh, called Sedge Hammer Plus. Okay, so we're going to actually pronounce the, uh, the plus symbol when we say this one. And this will be one that you might consider for the golf course. These are little packets meant to treat just a thousand square feet and they already contain the surfactant in the pouch. So it has a dry surfactant in there along with the ingredients. So the idea here is if you need to send out some folks in the afternoon to do some spot treating of sedges, they can take one of these pouches, pour it in their pump up sprayer, add a gallon of water, you know, get it all mixed together and then they can go out and spot treat sedges. So instead of having to measure out a super tiny amount and then add the surfactant with using the old sedge hammer formulation, the sedge hammer plus formulation is really meant for treating small areas. And it's really handy because it has that surfactant already in there. Uh, if you look at the label, it, it tells you a little bit about this. It doesn't tell you a lot, but again, here's what this little packet looks like that you can you can buy in the Sedge Hammer Plus formulation. And, and we and others have tested this. Here's some data from Michigan State just showing that the uh, you get equivalent control when you use the, the uh, old Sedge Hammer formulation, or not the old Sedge Hammer formulation, because they still sell it, the original Sedge Hammer formulation or this uh, additional Sedge Hammer Plus formulation, you get the same level of control when you apply the same amount of ingredient. Now, a newer sedge control product on the market is called Solero. It's a mazosulfuron, and um, it's one of the uh, uh, sulfonylurea herbicides that are on the market. And I mentioned this one because this one has really good activity on false green Kalinga, and we're going to come back to that in just a, just a bit. And this one is one that goes out anywhere from 8 to 14 ounces per acre, and that you need a uh, to one of those non-ionic surfactants when you use this one. And just to show you that it works on yellow nut sedge, you got some data here where we compare Solero to Sedge Hammer, and you see that we get comparable uh, results. All right, and then someone mentioned Certainty was a product that they use. Uh, Certainty is sulfosulfuron, and uh, it used to be labeled for cool season grasses, but they changed the label back in 2011, and so now you can only use it on warm season grasses. Uh, but certainly this is a great product for sedge control. Also on this one, any of these sulfonylurea herbicides, you're needing to add a non-ionic surfactant. Now there's several other good products, and just for sake of time, we don't have time to talk specifically about all of them. Someone mentioned Katana, that's a good one. Uh, that's going to be flaz uh, Someone mentioned uh, that they were using uh, Basagran, which I don't have listed here, but that's an older product that can work for yellow nut sedge control. 
And so I've tried to uh, kind of creatively show you that all of these work on yellow nut sedge, and then a few of them are also very good on purple nut sedge. Uh, Monument, Katana, Certainty, Image, also good on, on purple uh, nut sedge, as well as the annual nut sedge uh, species. Now, one that uh, I also want to just throw out there for those of you growing cool season grasses is that tenacity is one that will work for sedge control. We normally don't think about it for sedge control, but it is useful uh, for sedge control. So those are all notes about post-emergence herbicides. What about pre, can I control sedges with pre-emergence herbicides? And the answer is yes, there's a couple products that you can do this with. Uh, one of them is Tenacity, uh, we mentioned that, but another one is Echelon. Uh, so Echelon contains sulfentrazone, and sulfentrazone, that's the active ingredient in Dismiss, has good pre-emergence activity on uh, yellow nut sedge, um, but FMC is, has not really uh, marketed Dismiss as a pre only because uh, they want you to consider using Echelon because they know that you're going to go out and have to apply your pre sedge control about the same time you put out your pre broadleaf control. So they got this product Echelon, which combines the prodiamine, the ingredient in barricade, and sulfentrazone together uh, to give you that pre sedge control. And then I mentioned that uh, Tenacity can have some pre yellow nut sedge activity. Here's actually a picture where I've sprayed tenacity on the soil, and then a couple of days later, a yellow nut sedge plant tried to emerge out of the soil where I'd sprayed tenacity, and it actually emerges out of the ground already white because it's been bleached uh, from the activity of that herbicide. And if we look at some data on the pre-activity of yellow nut sedge, we see on the right, what would it look like if I didn't do anything, and then all these pre-treatments are working pretty good. The tenacity is not doing too bad. You see, as we get the rate higher, we make two applications, it's working okay. Dismiss by itself does a good job, but again, it's not marketed in that way. It doesn't mean you can't use it in that way. And then the Echelon product, uh, all those doing a really good job at preventing yellow nut sedge from emerging. And each of these products are gonna last a little bit different amount of time. My only uh, note to you is that they're probably only gonna give you about three weeks, maybe four weeks of pre-activity, uh, a little bit shorter with the tenacity, maybe a little longer with the sulfentrazone, just because these products are not going to last in the soil for a tremendous amount of times. So you will get pre-control, but only for maybe a month or so. All right, as our time's winding down, I want to switch to our other sedge species here. We've got purple nut sedge, annual sedge, a new one probably to you that I'll introduce called shining flat sedge. And then we'll talk about false green Kalinga and green Kalinga. So the first one is uh, purple nut sedge. It gets its name purple nut sedge because of the purple color of that uh, seed head. Here we see it compared to yellow nut sedge and you see the seeds fairly similar shape to it, maybe not as dense of a seed panicle, um, but we see that difference in color. One difference the, about purple nut sedge practically is although it produces tubers on the end of its rhizomes like yellow nut sedge does, purple nut sedge has more of a propensity to just spread via tubers. So like you see in this picture, it's produced a, a rhizome and then that rhizome, much like Kentucky bluegrass or quack grass or other rhizomatous grasses, has then hit the surface and made a new plant. And so purple nut sedge sometimes will just spread uh, laterally or in other times it will make a tuber. When it makes a tuber, it does so in a similar way to yellow nut sedge where that end of that rhizome will start to uh, enlarge and then it turns into this kind of big ugly looking uh, uh, mass and that's the tuber. Now you can distinguish uh, purple nut sedge and yellow nut sedge from one another in the field just looking by how sharp the leaf tip is. So purple nut sedge will have a tip that looks much like perennial ryegrass and the yellow nut sedge tip has a much longer tapering to a sharp point uh, tip. And so if you have the two side by side, you can tell the, color, tell the difference. And then also color wise, purple nut sedge is a much darker green color. Yellow nut sedge is that kind of yellow green color. And then here's the distribution, the general distribution of purple nut sedge. And the reason it doesn't go farther north is not because it just hasn't gotten there yet, but just because this one lacks cold hardiness to go 
uh, much farther north than, than where it already is. Here's some pictures of you know what it might look like on a tee box. Here's some, some Bermuda grass. Here's kind of a close up of the plant. You know, it looks much like any old sedge growing in the in this case some Bermuda grass. And then here's a picture of that uh, producing a seed head next to a cart path here. And so it's fairly easy to identify. Now, purple nut sedge is generally harder to control. So applications of dismiss, like we see on the on the left here, are not going to work as well for us. And so we typically need to switch to some, one of our more powerful sulfonylurea herbicides like Certainty or Monument or uh, Katana or uh, Solero. Those types of products are going to do better on purple nut sedge. Now I took the most common sedge control products as standalone ingredients on the left here and, and uh, from these tables that I showed you earlier and I tried to color code them. So maybe find the product or two that you normally use and look across and then see kind of where its strengths and weaknesses are and you'll see some products they will just generally perform well good or better across multiple sedge species. So you kind of go down this list and look at those. You'll see um, some of these products just doing a really good job, no matter what sedge species you have. So if you're not even sure which one you have, then one of these products would do a good job of these. Um, and you'll see sedge hammer is not bad, but it's only kind of fair on the Kalinga species. Uh, and then of these, the Solero and the sedge hammer are ones that are safe on cool season grasses, whereas the at, as well as warm season grasses, and then all these would be safe to use on most of our warm season grasses. All right, now annual sedge is another uh, sedge species that you'll find from time to time. As the name suggests, it's an annual that comes back by seed every year. And so we don't have a lot of data on how well the pre-emergence herbicides work. But we know that some of them, like Ronstar, will provide partial control of, of this particular species. Here's its distribution. And so you'll see in my area here in Indiana, we'll, we'll have uh, annual sedge. Um, it can be identified from its uh, kind of unique looking seed head. You typically find it in uh, wet areas, like shown here. This is an area that's kind of wet next to a sidewalk uh, going in a state park. Here's kind of a close up of what uh, that plant looks like. And this one will tolerate short mowing heights. So this is a, a sample, putting green sample that's you know grown out a little bit in the box on the way to my office. But right in the middle of it's an annual sedge uh, plant growing. You can see its seed head there. And so it will tolerate short mowing heights. So you could certainly find this in uh, your high maintenance areas of the golf course. Now, another very similar looking species is called shining flat sedge. And in Indiana, I actually see shining flat sedge more often than annual sedge. And so it looks very similar. It's just slightly smaller. And then the seed head, you know, it's kind of has that purple kind of brown color to it. And so here's the distribution of shining flat sedge. Notice it's more of a northern distribution. Again, it's got this very distinct looking uh, seed head with brown colors. You'll find it growing, you know, in your in your turf. It looks very similar to the annual sedge, but as the season progresses, that seed head color will really fully develop. And again, you see this next to, in this is the case, it's a wet area next to a cart path, an area that's compacted so the grass isn't growing very well. And basically this whole strip right here is almost 100% of this shining uh, flat sedge. But it will tolerate shortcut turf. So here's some growing in uh, turf grown, mown at about 0.3 inches or so uh, on a golf course uh, fairway. And unfortunately we don't have any studies published on how to control this sedge species. I hope to work on some in the future but we think most of our normal products will work well on this one. All right, our last two species to touch on are both Kalingas. There are many species of Kalinga, and we're gonna talk about two today. One is called false green Kalinga, and the other is called green Kalinga, okay? Now here's the 
kind of the general geography of fall screen Kalinga. Now this map is developing because a few years ago, this map would have looked something kind of like, like maybe this. And uh, even since I made this map about a year ago, I know that at least in Indiana and, and, and Ohio, this map should at least go out to like this. And I can't say beyond that. I just know that I haven't quite drawn it far enough north because I found samples even farther north in recent uh, history. This is a perennial that spreads uh, by uh, rhizomes. So you'll find it growing in all heights of cut. So it can be in a rough where it doesn't necessarily look bad, right? It just looks, uh, just looks like a lighter colored grass growing in there. You can, uh, uh, again, it spreads by rhizomes and seed. We'll look at the seed here in just a second. Again, it's just kind of lighter, uh, lighter green colored patches in the rough area. It produces a seed head that has lots of seed, and these seeds are generally pretty viable. We, don't, we know that it can spread by seed, but uh, that seed germination is not well studied at all. It tolerates a short height to cut. So here's it growing in a bent grass collar that's, you know, at the end of August, a really stressed bent grass. And this Kalinga patch uh, is doing just fine. Here's pictures of it in a tea box where it shows up as this light green uh, color. Here's kind of a close up of, of, uh, of the plant with me and my finger in the picture showing what that, what that looks like. You can even kind of tell the shininess of it here. And uh, some of these plants, you can almost kind of tell it's three-ranked nature just by the angle that the leaves are coming off the stem. Now, this one is a perennial, so it will emerge from those rhizomes. You can kind of see this isn't seeds germinating, but it emerging from those nodes on those rhizomes in May. And then it will grow all summer until uh, fall when it will get frosted and uh, turn this brown color. And what I normally find is when I find one of these sedges, I usually find lots of sedge species. So for example, in this picture alone, I have uh, the false green Kalinga, the shining flat sedge, and annual sedge all growing right next to one another. So the same environments that you might find one sedge species, you might find uh, multiple ones. And here are just a couple other pictures. False green Kalinga on the top, Shining flat sedge with a finer leaf texture on the bottom. The false green Kalinga on the left and the annual sedge on the right. To me, annual sedge kind of looks like a clump of ryegrass, perennial ryegrass. And that's kind of how I first noticed it. All right, so quick poll and then I only got a couple slides left. So, so for those of you that have false green Kalinga, um, Tell me what product you're using for uh, control. If you don't have it, I guess you don't have to uh, comment here. I figure probably a lot of you might, or you think you might now after seeing some of these slides. And Aaron, while this voting is taking place, there's a question here. How well does MSMA control yellow nut sedge? Okay, did I leave that one off my uh, chart? Certainly, uh, MSMA will provide some control of, of, of yellow nut sedge. And uh, that one, generally, we just kind of rank it as, um, as in the fair category. So it works, but maybe not as good as some of these, particularly as some of these sulfonylurea herbicides. So yeah, if you have some, if you know, if you're in the south and you can still use MSMA on your golf course, then you could certainly do that. It's just not going to work as well. In my opinion, you probably need at least two applications of maybe MSMA compared to situations where maybe one application of, of one of these sulfonylurea herbicides or dismiss uh, would do a good job. Okay. And it looks like voting has slowed on this. Let me give you the poll results. And uh, comment is... Katana on Bermuda for one of the others there. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, great. These are that's good. I want to I want to particularly hone in on you that said uh, sedge hammer or dismiss. I want to show you some data. I think would be helpful for you. And somebody puts a comment here. We use dismiss and sedge hammer, but 
but use basic grain on our Bermuda okay. greens. Uh huh. Okay. So this is some work that's kind of fresh off the presses, some work we've done the last uh, two years. Uh, some work in New Jersey and uh, with Matt Elmore, who I've collaborated with, and some in Indiana. So I'll show you our data here. Matt's showing you uh, showing you control here, and what you see here on the left, um, the green bars are are applications of Solero. So Solero again, newer herbicide, and you see one application at eight ounces of Solero that gives us almost 100% control. Two applications, 100% control. If we up the rate again, really good control with one application. Two applications, 100% control. Now compare that with Pro Sedge or Sedge Hammer in the red bars, and you'll see you have to make at least two applications to get uh, above 80% control. If you look at Dismiss, you'll see it did not do nearly as uh, well for us in this particular uh, trial. But a Dismiss plus Solero, if you were looking for something to give you faster control, but also good long-term control, uh, that combination did a good job for us. And the, the reason you might say, well, if you're in the South, I'll say that you can get good control with Dismiss, but these were the low rates of Dismiss because this study was done on bent grass. So let me clarify this, that this slide is showing low rates of Dismiss. We use uh, the four ounce rate of Dismiss in this study, whereas on Bermuda grass, you can use up to 12 ounces. And certainly Dismiss looks a lot better on false green Kalinga in, at that high rate. Now the data from Indiana, it's the same study, but basically uh, showing you the reverse kind of look at the data. Now we're looking at the percent of false green Kalinga we find in the plots. We find that uh, the non-treated over here had about 45% Kalinga. And if we made one application of Solero, we knocked that down less than 10%. Two applications at the low rate, we had zero. One application at the high rate, only a couple percent, but two applications at the uh, high rate and no uh, Kalinga. And you can see here for us with the Pro Sedge, either one or two applications, we still had a bunch of Kalinga and one or two applications at low rate of Dismiss still had a bunch of Kalinga. So certainly we see that false green Kalinga is really well controlled by this Solero. And so if you've been using Dismiss or Pro Sedge, then I think you should consider that uh, adding Solero as a tool uh, in getting control of false green Kalinga in cool season grasses. Now I haven't worked uh, as much uh, false green Kalinga control in warm season grasses, but I imagine if you're using uh, Katana and Monument, you would get very good control uh, comparable to Solero. But again, I haven't done those studies to look at those direct comparisons. Now, if we switch to green Kalinga, we see its distribution is much different. It's much more in the south. It has limited cold tolerance, so it doesn't move very far north. And the way you can distinguish these two species is very nuanced. So if you look at this seed head here, you'll see that instead of having one little puff ball here, it can often have uh, a second little uh, part to its seed head, okay? And you see the seed head is more of an oval shape than a round shape, and so that's one of the ways you can distinguish these two species. If you just look at the plants themselves, it's really hard to distinguish. So it's really hard to tell the difference between these two. You probably know that which one you have mainly by what state you're in. But again, the green Kalinga is uh, slightly smaller of a plant, and it can have one to three of these heads on its, uh, uh, basically on its seed head, whereas the false green Kalinga just has one and has a round shape to it. The other way that you can tell the difference is the false green Kalinga will only have a seed head at the end of the summer, the start of the fall, whereas green Kalinga can kind of flower all summer long. So, Lastly, uh, just a couple quick tips. If you have sedges growing up in ornamental beds, you know, around the clubhouse and so on, there are options for you. Uh, sedge hammer, dismiss, certainty, and uh, pennant magnum, which is metallicolor, uh, all have some labeling. Some is what's called over the top, meaning you could spray it over the ornamental plant and the weed, and others are what's called directed meaning you can use it for spot spraying the weed around the ornamental plants. So I encourage you to go to either the CDMS website or this website called Terms Dev to find labels 
and particularly often the supplemental label, sometimes the label, the normal label, but uh, uh, sometimes a supplemental label will have notes uh, on um, you know all these different plants. So if you had some, uh, let's say some junipers, which is a Chinese junipers, and you had yellow nut sedge growing up in there, this label would tell you that you could apply it um, before you plant the juniper or spray it right over top of the juniper to kill the yellow nut sedge plants. So um, there aren't very many products that allow you to kill nut sedge in, in ornamentals uh, and in landscapes, but there are a few out there, so I encourage you to do that or right, to use those products. Sedge hammer just kind of has some generic notes that says, hey, you can use it on some species and not others, so test it out. Uh, Pennant magnum lists a whole list of plants and which ones are safe uh, and which ones aren't. And remember that you can use some kind of a sprayer with a hood on it when you're spray, spot treating in those ornamental beds to, to help avoid any unwanted drift onto, onto the plant. So, so thanks for letting me kind of rush through all these slides today and happy to take any uh, questions you have at the end here um, before we part for the day. And again, I'm happy to take any questions by email uh, that you might have um, as well. And I think uh, this next slide here is uh, has all my contact information, so. Yay, it does have all your contact information. Thanks, Erin. I'm gonna move us just back for a minute so people can write down that code. Um, oh yeah, sorry. 0 0.1 education points, you go to the GCSA website 999-22566-29788 on the affidavit, just like what you would for a chapter event. We thank PBI Gordon for sponsoring. If in the future you're listening to this recording, input the date of the that you're listening, not the original presentation date. All of you today can use the original presentation date. Okay, first question I'm seeing here is, Kalinga in Ultradorf Greens is becoming a bigger problem. What's your safest go-to herbicide control for that on greens that's labeled? Okay, you're testing my you're testing my memory here on uh, on products that are labeled on Bermuda grass greens. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Brazen and I wrote a, uh, an article in Golf Course Management about four or five years ago that covered that and there are a couple there are a couple of sulfonate urea herbicides that are labeled for putting greens i just don't recall which two they are off the top of my head so if you want to send me an email i can find that article and send it to you um because the issue is like like you as you well know not very many of these products are labeled for putting green use um and so you could um I can dig that up. I want to. I got a name on the tip of my tongue, but I want to tell you the wrong answer. So it'd be better if we could follow up by email, and I can get that uh, that precise and correct answer to you uh, afterwards. Okay, excellent. Thank you for being willing to do that. Is it possible that shining flat sedge is in California, even though it's not on your map? Uh, it is very possible that it's. Uh, yeah, my my map is based on. Um, where where botanists, you know, when uh, there's all these uh, plant collections, you know, around the world where botanists go in and they they want to catalog where they're finding these plants, and so they they can publish that data online. And so what I've done is looked at where they're publishing, where they're finding these, and kind of used that plus my, my knowledge on hey where I find these plants and where people send me these plants to identify. So certainly it could be out in California. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt that but remember there's 5,000 sedge species so it could just be another species that looks looks similar to it but it's very possible it's out there okay I have also uploaded into the handout area the two Purdue extension publications that you mentioned earlier Aaron the one on yellow nut sedge and the one on sedge for professionals so if anybody wants to download those they can do that now um, have you, okay, you know me in the chemical pronunciations. Have you done any testing on primal 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, for me, uh, yes, yeah. a little bit. Uh, so that's that's the main ingredient in a product from PBI Gordon called Vexus that will be coming out on the market soon. I didn't include a lot of data because uh, you know there's some of that is still pending uh, EPA registration and they're still trying to you know figure out what formulations and stuff that uh, they're going to send. Uh, but yes, I've had good, very good results with uh, yellow nut sedge control on that particular ingredient. I have not tested it on other sedge species. But, uh, but I do know that, uh, that certainly that's a good sedge control product and it'll be a new tool that we'll have uh, certainly for us uh, in the future. And that one, uh, as w and so I'll just leave it at that. Be a new, new tool for us in the future. And yes, that one does work well on yellow nut sedge um, from my testing. Okay, great. Have you done any research on cultural practices done after post-emergent applications? like verdict cutting areas that have declined from herbicide sprays to promote turf grasses to fill in dead bear areas? So a little bit. So there's a couple of things we need to think about there. One, we need to think about well, how long does this herbicide take to work? So if it's one that's slow, you know, we wouldn't want to spray and then go verdict cut, you know, the next day, for example, because will be disrupting that plant and its ability to be moving that herbicide around. And so we want to certainly give it some time to move around. But I understand your desire to get in there and replant some of those areas or to maybe encourage the spread of some of those existing grasses. What I like about a lot of the sulfonylurea urea herbicides is that they slowly kill the weed. And in my experience, generally what you can do is slowly kill that weed and then the grass will fill in nicely behind it without having to encourage a lot of recovery. Now the other comment you need to, or the other thing you need to think about, particularly if you're seeding on grass, is you need to think about, um, or sprigging, either way, if you're planting something afterwards, is what the residual, residual activity of that herbicide is and what effect it may have on the new plants. So let's say I wanted to, let's say I had some Bermuda grass and I sprayed one of these products and then I wanted to go, uh, you know, seed some more Bermuda grass in the area. Uh, well, we know that some of these products, you know, you, you got to wait two or three weeks after uh, making an application before the residual levels are low enough in the soil that they won't inhibit the germination of those plants. So the best advice I could have for you there is really to look closely at those label statements um, because, you know, myself and my colleagues around the country have done those types of uh, projects to look at, well, how soon after we make an application we can get in there and plant safely. And so usually there's going to be a restriction that's that's anywhere from two weeks to maybe six weeks with these products after making an application before you can get in there and replant. So so think about how slow does this product work, and if it's a slower working one like the sulfonylureas, then I'd wait you know at least a good four or five days before I got in there and bird cut or did anything like that, and then uh, check out those label statements on replanting intervals, uh, particularly those by uh, sprigs or seed to see how long you might might wait. And if you're having any trouble finding that, again, just shoot me an email and I can help you find that information. Thanks, Aaron. I am not seeing any other questions here. Did you have any closing comments for us today? Um, I do, I found that paper. Do you can, can I drop it in that same Dropbox uh, folder? that uh, the paper that talks about the uh, herbicide safe on greens? Yes, and um, I can include, is it published on the web someplace, Aaron? Uh, it probably is, it's a GCM article, so certainly. It oh, it's be. a GCM article. Yeah, put it yeah. in Dropbox and then I'll include that link um, with the follow-up email and that way everybody can get it. Uh, since uh, we have a couple of people who have exited and it'll take time to put into to upload download as you know okay perfect thank you well thank you and thank everybody for joining us today some great questions here appreciate it uh, appreciate PBI Gordon for arranging this and uh, hope to see you all online again soon have a great day everybody <laughs>